Granted, it's taken me nearly five years to get to this review, as I had mentioned in my review of Thunderbirds vs. Thunderbirds back in 2014, but... Better late than never, right? If you were a child of the 1980s, then there's a strong chance at one time or another you encountered the animated series of Inspector Gadget. Basically, a more kid-friendly version of Robocop. Except very naive and incompetent. The series ran for two seasons, lasting three years, seeing Gadget and his family on madcap adventures in one of the most slapstick animated series of the 1980s. From its art style to the catchy and legendary theme song, when you heard the siren, you knew you were in for a fun-filled 22 minutes. So when the news broke that an Inspector Gadget movie was being made for 1999, I was actually very excited at this prospect. I was a huge Gadget fan growing up and loving the idea of the various tools that would emerge from his hat. Especially the Gadget Chopper. He wouldn't love that. So with this being the 20th anniversary of this flick, has time been kind to it? Time to find out. Go Go Gadget Movie! The movie has a campy and family-friendly tone that's able to have tongue-in-cheek moments where it's funny for the kids and has subtle wink-wink moments for the adults. The pacing doesn't really slow down as there's always something going on plot-wise with Gadget still adjusting to his bionic-enhanced body, or Claw furthering his schemes of making advances for his company and accepting his new Claw. Although the idea that he could compare himself to Madonna is a bit of a stretch, but that said, Rupert is a better actor than her, and he would know he worked with her on 2000's The Next Best Thing. Madge, I love ya, but acting ain't your strong suit. Sorry. And I wasn't aware before this movie that the technical term for a nickname was a dashing appellation. The more you know. Although, to hear Andy Dick say... Dashing appellation, what is that, a hillbilly with a tuxedo? was a little unexpected, yet a nice swerve to show how less than sophisticated Kramer was. There is a nice moment of self-aware humour, where Claw has Gadget strung up and his shell opened and accuses him of watching too many Saturday morning cartoons. Now, whether this was a reference to the animated series or just running down the tired use of the phrase, you'll never get away with this, I'm inclined to think it was the latter. Because that line has somewhat become cliché over the years to where it feels like an outdated trope. Speaking of things that feel dated... Uh-oh. Remember when that was a thing? Oh, boy. Throwing in the angle of a doppelganger is something that has been done before, but it works for the purpose of the story of Gadget hailed as a hero of Riverton, only to have his image tarnished by Robo Gadget's antics. The Gadget Mobile had a huge redesign when compared to its animated counterpart that would go from a minivan to an aerodynamic police car that somewhat resembled Kit from Knight Rider that had been airing for a full year by this point. In the movie, Gadget Mobile is a white and chrome 1964 Lincoln Continental convertible instead of a Matra Murena Toyota Celicia hybrid from the animated series and does not possess the ability to transform from a minivan to a police car. Gadget Mobile can drive and think for himself and is voiced by comedian D.L. Hewley. Do you really want to rip off from Knight Rider that much? The movie started out with Gadget dreaming and longing to be a hero, and at the end of the movie, his dream and journey comes full circle as he saves the girl, has Claw arrested, and is respected by Chief Quimpy. Journey... complete. Yeah, you betcha. Oh boy. I'm gonna deal with the biggest flaw in the cast of this. Broderick is a more than capable actor that could make anything work despite what some people might think. Unfortunately, he was poorly miscast as the titular character. Yes, he does have the naive and absent-minded qualities that we are familiar with Inspector Gadget. The difference is, is that Don Adams had charisma and panache, and Matthew had neither. He has good chemistry with his co-stars, but that's about the only redeeming aspects I can comment about his performance. As Robo Gadget, he's actually amusing having the duality to be a bad guy. And the major contrast with the aspect of this role, he's going in full ham and with charisma to boot. <laughs> See what I mean? Matthew, you're a good actor, 
but you really should have said no to this. There are actors that chew up the scenery. There are some actors that like to go full ham. Rupert is able to do both. Everett's portrayal as the main antagonist has a much lighter and campier tone when compared to the more sinister portrayal of Frank Welker from the animated series. But to his credit, Rupert makes it work. And you are completely insane! And true, I let you better fat! <gasps> Bring on the brownies! <laughs> well, that certainly panned out differently. I thought Brenda was actually one of the more better developed characters in the movie where you forget it's Jolie Fisher and you're actually seeing the character in question. This was actually the second movie I'd ever seen Jolie in, as I had previously seen her in 1994's The Mask. Brenda comes across as warm, confident and intelligent and showing real compassion for what happened to John and walking him through his transition to being Inspector Gadget. This was pretty much a faithful representation as being more competent and resourceful than that of her naive and incompetent bionic uncle. She doesn't have her computer book and communicator watch as her animated version had, although she does have the watch at the end. Which I might add was predicting future tech, especially in the context of tablets, but she has the same intuition and insight as the 83 counterpart. But, then again, Michelle Trachtenberg is just that good of an actress, and she's one of the better casting choices of this flick. This was another character that was accurate to the source material. The only major difference is that Quimby sees Gadget as something that the police force could do without, unlike his animated counterpart who sees Gadget as his top agent. Coleman plays the gruff police chief well for the limited scenes that he's in, but he does make it worth it. The only difference between him and his 83 animated series incarnation is that he didn't have Gadget throwing back messages that would self-destruct. This was just done as a means of Don making a cameo as a connection to the 83 animated series. It should also be noted that Don had actually retired from voicing Gadget that same year, but his inclusion was a nice easter egg and pleasing for those who had grown up with the animated series. The special effects are more than satisfying, and to be fair, Disney are more than competent at handling that. The visual effects are one of the few aspects of this flick that have aged well. Now, I know some will get on this flick's case for not being realistic, but that's part of the charm. It's basically a live-action cartoon, so the fact that Gadget can have multiple features emerge from his hat or fingers is part of the allure. If this had a realistic tone, then yeah, you could make the argument that the physics are laughable. But, when you accept that this is basically a live-action cartoon, it actually takes you into the story where you have the suspension of disbelief and are just able to enjoy it for what it is. That and seeing Gadget use the Gadget Chopper in live-action was a treat for this long-time fan. Also, the junkyard scene was really well edited to where you can actually believe that Matthew's head was grafted onto a cyborg body with its casing opened and removed. John Debney had the responsibility of composer, and already he hit so many home runs with his take on the gadget theme at the start of the movie. To where it honours the spirit of the original. But is able to have a much grander scale. The rest of the score does its job well, where it has these sad moments where the cast and the audience think Gadget is down and out, to heroic moments. Has this movie aged well? Sadly, I'm going to have to say no. It's not to say that it's unwatchable, but when you make casting choices and opt for elements that don't really make any sense, or elements that are borrowed from something else, <coughs> Knight Rider, then it does add up to a less-than-great movie experience. It's a guilty pleasure at the very least if you're a neutral spectator. However, if you're someone like me that grew up with the original, then it does leave a less-than-pleasant aftertaste in your mouth. But it's not something I will re-watch regularly. Watch it now and again, maybe for the nostalgia and being reminded of the 80s series, but that's about it. It spawned a sequel that was a direct-to-DVD release in 2003 with only a budget of $12 million, $78 million than what the original had to work with, with only D.L. Hewley reprising his role as Gadgetmobile 
as all the other characters had been recast, including French Stewart replacing Broderick as Gadget. I've never seen it, and I have no intention of seeing it either. And word on the wire is that as of May 2015, a reboot is in development. This has me at odds because way too many reboots happen these days. Just ask Batman, the Ninja Turtles, Spider-Man, and the less we say about the Mummy reboot, the better. I'll give it the benefit of the doubt at the very least until I see something tangible with regards to concept art or a trailer. Just don't make it dark and gritty, folks. Last thing we need Gadget doing is asking multiple people, WHERE WERE THE OTHER DRUGS GOING?! whilst holding someone upside down. So, let's not give them ideas? Have a nice balance where it's campy, but it knows when to get serious. Like 99's The Mummy. And next time, cast someone better as Gadget. Next time. Good night from the night.